So I'm just going to get started with a little introduction. So my name is Claire Ladd, and I'm the Programs and Services Manager at the Massachusetts Nonprofit Network, or MNN. So thank you for joining us today for this webinar. And just a few housekeeping items before we dig into the content. So the recording and the slides from today's program will be emailed to you following the webinar. Just please keep an eye on your email for that in the next couple of days. Additionally, if you have any technical difficulties during the workshop, you can use the chat to let us know and we can try to help you out. You can also submit questions via the chat in the Q&A box, and there will be time for questions. I also want to give a little background about us here at MNM. Our three goals are to strengthen the nonprofit sector through advocacy, public awareness of our sector, and capacity building services. This webinar is part of our capacity building offerings and just our overall webinar series. Please stay tuned for future topics that we offer webinars on and reach out to us if you have any topics you'd like to see. Our efforts are made possible by our more than 600 member organizations. To those of you who are members, thank you for your partnership. And if you have not yet joined, but would like to take advantage of the opportunities, trainings, cost savings, please visit massnonprofitnet.org slash join to find out more. All right, so today's webinar is what borrowers need to know about tax exempt financing presented by Kapitas and Bluestein LLP. Kapitas and Bluestein provides legal services to a wide range of clients with a focus on nonprofit, for profit, and public clients in the areas of health and human services, education, and real estate development and finance. So, our three presenters today are Robert Keogh, Cheryl Howard, and Eric Russell. Robert is a partner in the firm's transactional group with a concentration in the areas of affordable housing, real estate finance and development, and general corporate law. During his 30-year career, Bob has represented clients in all facets of the acquisition, financing, development, and disposition of commercial and residential real estate. Cheryl Howard is a partner in the firm's transactional group representing commercial, nonprofit, and public clients in real estate and financing matters. In connection with her real estate practice, she has worked with a broad range of clients including health and human service providers, schools and universities, and public entities. And Eric Russell is an associate in the firm's transactional group, where his practice focuses on assisting public and not-for-profit clients with governance issues, organizational structure, formation of new organizations, dissolutions, management of charitable funds, and federal, state, and local tax exemptions. So I'll now hand it over to Bob to get us started. Okay. Uh, thank you, Claire, and thank you all for joining us. As Claire said, we're here to talk about tax exempt bond financing and hopefully demystify it a little bit and see if it is a viable option for some of the projects that your organizations are planning to undertake. Uh, I believe we circulated a poll question to see if any of our attendees had any uh, tax exempt experience. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any results. All right, they're coming in now. Okay. Well, we're curious to see what your experience has been. Uh, if you've dealt with tax exempt bond financing in the past, uh, traditionally it's been considered complicated, expensive, and not something that is available to the smaller developers. But uh, hopefully, uh, part of our mission here today is to explain that it is something that may be appropriate for your organization. So, that said, what is a tax exempt bond? A tax exempt bond is simply a bond where the interest payable on the bond is exempt from federal income tax. Because the interest is exempt from income tax, your lender is willing to accept a lower rate of interest on the loan because it is still receiving the same after tax treatment as from a, a loan with a higher rate of interest. This lower rate of interest gets passed on to you, the borrower, and thus gives you, the borrower, greater flexibility in terms of some of the projects that you can undertake. Under the Internal Revenue Code, there are only, only government entities are authorized to issue tax exempt bonds. And there are two types of government tax exempt bonds. The one is a traditional so called government bond, which is issued by a government and is used for government purposes, such as the construction of government buildings, roads, things like that. The second category is called a private activity bonds, which as the name implies, is a bond issued by the government to a 
private party that otherwise qualifies for tax exempt treatment under the code. There are several categories of, tax, of private activity bonds under the code. Uh, education, affordable housing are a couple of the ones that you may have seen in your professional career. But the one category that we're going to focus on is the so-called qualified 501c3 bonds. These are bonds that can be issued for projects undertaken by tax exempt entities and the projects qualify for tax exempt treatment due to their educational, cultural, health care, or related purposes. So that is what a tax exempt bond is. What is the structure in the parties in a typical tax exempt bond transaction? In a typical financing transaction, your organization would enter into a bilateral relationship with your lender. In a tax exempt bond transaction, the structure is triangular because you need the involvement of a government entity because they are the only entities that have the ability to issue a tax exempt bond. In a bond transaction, the agency would issue a tax exempt bond for your project and it would sell the bond to a third party, either by means of a private placement or a public offering. Because public offerings of bonds tend to be fairly complicated, expensive, and are generally reserved for big projects, we will assume for purposes of this seminar that you are going to have a bond transaction whereby the bond will be purchased by a third party, usually a bank, by a direct purchase of the bond at closing. So at the closing, the government agency will issue the bond and sell it to the bond purchaser slash lender. The bond purchaser now becomes the lender and the person that you will deal with in terms of administrating the loan. So as of closing, you will have entered into a relationship that on a certain level is similar to the bilateral relationship that exists between a traditional borrower and a traditional bank. However, because these are tax exempt bonds, both the issuer and the bond purchaser are going to be very concerned with making sure that the project that you build and operate will continue to qualify for tax exempt treatment. Um, and I was going to flag that we recommend um, that the kind of the three main parties to the transaction, you know, the bond purchaser, the issuer, and the borrower, um, all have separate counsel. Um, the interests of those parties uh, diverge in different ways. Um, and my experience is that the transaction is goes a little more smoothly, and the end result is better for the borrower um, if they have separate counsel. Yeah, that's true. It, it's not the type of transaction where one one lawyer can kind of wear three different hats. So that is your typical tax exempt bond structure. So what are the benefits and drawbacks of using tax exempt bond financing? The primary benefit, the borrower gets a much lower rate of interest, thus allowing it to pro pursue projects that might not otherwise be financeable. But that comes at the price of having some drawbacks. First of all, you need to qualify. This is not a situation where you can walk into a local branch and apply for a loan. You have to qualify with a qualified state agency that can issue the bonds and the process there is competitive. There are increased closing costs because you're using a bond transaction. There's increased complexity in staff time that will be required of your organization to deal with the various regulatory rules and regulations that come with it undertaking and administrating a bond loan. The lead time for closing is certainly gonna be longer or most, most generally is longer than a traditional financing. There will be additional administrative costs and time required for the reporting and compliance procedures that go with the bond deal. And after the transaction closes, you'll have to deal with some of the restrictions and regulations that come with operating a bond finance project. But for all that, we are going to assume that you are ready, willing, and able to undertake this challenge and you are ready to proceed 
with your bond deal. Since we noted this is a type of transaction that will require a bank that will serve as the bond purchaser, you are going to need to find a lender to work with. And Cheryl is going to tell you all you need to know about that. Um, so uh, term sheet considerations. I mean, in essence, you know, you're 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 getting a loan. Um, and so many of the term sheet considerations are consistent, you know, for any loan. Um, you know, I, one special note um, with, as Bob mentioned, is that you have to be eligible for tax exempt bond financing. Um, in connection with the interest rate, I mean, this is going to be a key item for you because especially in this environment where interest rates are all over the place, um, you'll want to have the, you know, the best deal you can get. Um, and you'll the, you'll look at the term. Typically, um, tax exempt bond financing is going to be relatively long term financing. Um, next slide. Um, the collateral. Um, so you know the real estate um, that's being acquired or improved um, may serve as the collateral. Um, you know another thing to consider is if the lender is looking for additional collateral. Um, do you have any restricted assets? Have donors put restrictions on some of your funds? Um, that could be problematic, that mean you can't use them as collateral for a loan. Um, do you have investment accounts? We've had issues with um, certain um, investment houses not being willing to sign a control agreement, which makes it harder to for the lender to perfect its interest in those accounts. Um, and also your need for flexibility. You know, you may not want to have funds that you can't that are tied up um, if you need them for your operations on a day-to-day -day basis. With respect to guarantors, um, you know, this might be the case where you have um, a parent entity serving as the guarantor um, because the, you know, the borrower is a you know, single purpose entity um, or is newly formed or doesn't have sufficient assets. Um, again, that's something to consider, especially if that parent entity has other financing um, that might limit its ability to guarantee additional financing. Um, with respect to the financial covenants and the financial reporting, um, you want to make sure the financial covenants are, are, are doable for your organization. Um, you want to have some margin. Um, if, if you're meeting them this year, you may want to consider whether there's anything atypical about this year um, that made it easier or more difficult to meet those covenants. Uh, with respect to the reporting obligations, you want to make sure those are um, kind of in line with what you're currently doing. Next slide. You know, operational covenants. So you may see the lender want to have consent rights over changes in management, uh, the board, uh, the governing documents. Um, in particular, um, I usually recommend pushing back on uh, kind of those changes over a board, especially if you have a volunteer board or a board where there's, you know, often a regular turnover. Um, there may be prohibitions on additional indebtedness. Um, so you need to think about, you know, what what types of indebtedness do we need to encourage us to operate our business? Um, and there you know, may be limits on operating accounts. Um, in terms of the structure of the debt and repayment, I mean, again, you'd want to look at kind of how that um, how that that's structured. Um, you know, there may be additional letters, letters of credit or swaps um, in connection with that. Um, and then with respect to sub debt, um, one note that I wanted to flag is that you cannot refinance conventional financing with tax exempt bond financing. It doesn't mean that you, if you are engaging in a refinancing, it doesn't mean that it's impossible, but it may mean that you'll have some tax exempt bonds and some taxable bonds um, to cover the refinancing. Um, Intercreditor issues. So if there is sub debt, you know, obviously that um, lender is going to need to agree to subordinate their interest to the primary lender. Um, and then timing. You want to make sure that the timing of kind of all of that works together. Um, and then, you know, my final uh, item bears repeating, you know, shop the deal. Um, we had a client in particular that had, um, they wanted to refinance some debt. Uh, they had a long-term lender that they worked with, you know, many times over the years and had gone to that lender for a term sheet. For other reasons, they decided to solicit offers from other banks, and they found out their long-term lender wasn't giving them the best deal, um, and they used those um, other offers uh, to leverage some changes with their primary lender. So it was incredibly useful um, and added a lot of value for the client. Um, now, the next piece of this is the financing or refinancing due diligence. Um, what If you're engaging in kind of a new acquisition, you know, many of these are going to be items that you would be doing um, kind of as, as any buyer of real estate. Um, and if it's a refinancing, um, this is going to be a chance for you to dig through your files and see what you, obta what you obtained when you acquired the property. Um, with respect to title, you want to kind of dust off any title policy that you may have. 
you might consider um, having a title company update the title just to see if there's um, an old discharge or other kind of title issues that have crept in over the years um, that weren't properly dealt with. Um, so you can clean up that title in advance of kind of giving anything to the lender. Um, with respect to survey, you want to locate any as-built plans. Um, environmental, similarly, if you did a phase one when you acquired the property, you're, you're going to want to dust that off. Um, my, uh, the lender will certainly want a new phase one. Um, most lenders um, are willing to agree to um, uh, kind of the phase one that the borrower does if you can obtain a reliance letter. Um, so that's, and that can be a lead time item in particular if the phase one reveals any additional testing is required. Um, so it's something that I usually recommend if you're buying real estate, you would do it during the due diligence. If you're refinancing, it may be worth doing early. Um, on corporate housekeeping, um, because the tax exempt bond financing is certainly going to require kind of a standard um, opinion from your attorneys, in addition to a 501c3 opinion from your attorneys, it's important to make sure your kind of corporate house is in order. Um, so, you know, are your annual reports up to date? Because if you're an entity that files annual reports, you're going to need a good standing certificate. Um, have you looked at your bylaws recently? Are they understandable? Because your attorney is going to be reviewing your bylaws and making sure they're sufficiently clear so that they can say that you've kind of duly adopted um, the resolutions you need to adopt. Um, board votes, you know, are, are your, is your board generally on, uh, on board with the financing? Um, you might want to think about what your current meeting schedule is. Um, one important vote that you're going to need to take as early on as possible is the intent resolution. Um, that's basically the organization's, um, a vote that says the organization intends to engage in tax exempt bond financing. Um, it's important because you can be reimbursed for some capital expenditures incurred up to 60 days prior to taking that vote. So taking that vote starts the clock for being reimbursed for some of the expenses that you're probably already incurring in connection with your project. Um, so again, it's important to take that early. Um, you can usually get a form of that vote from your attorney, and sometimes the lender's attorney has a form of that vote. Um, and then last, the approval of the financing. Um, this is going to be very key. This vote will be scrutinized by your attorney. You will certainly want your attorney to draft it, and for their, the attorney will likely circulate it to the um, other attorneys in the deal to make sure that they're, they find the vote satisfactory. Um, that's, um, and you may, when timing that vote, you may think about um, you know, do you have a meeting scheduled that's going to, um, you know, in terms of timing, be about right? Um, or do you think you'll need to schedule a special meeting? Um, and then last, um, kind of existing financing and approvals. Um, if you have existing financing, if any of that financing remains in place, if you're the guarantor and you have some, you know, a line of credit or other financing, you need to look and see what approvals are going to be required to engage in this new financing, unless it's being paid off um, with the bond financing. Um, next slide. Um, appraisal, you know, this is certainly something that the um, lender is going to require. It might not be something that you do in advance, um, but it is going to be a, kind of a lead time item. Insurance, it's useful to know upfront what types of insurance your lender will require and how your lender wants to be listed on the certificates. Um, it's just my experience that uh, you end up going back and forth with certificates until you get one that's actually right. So useful to start with that process sooner rather than later. UCC and litigation searches. Again, this is something your lender is likely to want done you know, in some proximity to the closing date. Um, but you might consider doing it up front just to make sure that um, if there's, if there, for instance, an old UCC that was never terminated, um, you could get a glimpse of that and start kind of cleaning that up a little bit. Um, or if there's litigation that you know you're going to have to talk to the lender about, you get a heads up on that. Um, the TEFRA notice, um, this is a timing issue. It's not something the borrower drafts. Um, it's, the, it's the issuer's kind of notice to the public and a public hearing um, that they're preparing to um, kind of issue the bonds. Um, again, it's, it's a timing issue. It's something the issuer will draft, not something the borrower will, will draft. Um, and last, you know, the 501c3 diligence, which Eric is going to cover in his part of the slide. I'm going to hand it back to Bob to talk about construction. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. So uh, in addition to refinancing projects, uh, tax exempt bond financing is also available for construction projects. And uh, if you were to undertake a construction project, uh, it would uh, in process be very similar to a traditional uh, borrower lender relationship on a construction loan. 
So that means you would have to assemble your uh, project team to uh, work with the lender in terms of uh, building your project using the bank financing. So first of all, you have to get your architect. Uh, there are no bond specific requirements that would apply for the particular architect that you would choose. So you just want to choose an architect that has experience with your particular uh, type of project. And depending on where you're building it, uh, experience in the particular locale that you're operating. Uh, obviously certain parts of the state, Boston, Seaport District, uh, are very complicated areas with lots of uh, zoning and permitting rules. So it's always a good idea to go with someone who has experience, not only with your project, but with the place where you're trying to build it. You also want an architect that is familiar with uh, bank financing, is comfortable working with the bank in terms of dealing with their documentation uh, regarding certifications that they need to give, uh, the requisition forms that they need to fill out as part of the monthly requisition process and things of that nature. And also one who is uh, you know, properly uh, insured which is not always a given with uh, smaller architects. You're also going to need a general contractor. Again, uh, there are no bond specific requirements for your general contractor, but you do want someone who is experienced in the type of project that you're trying to build. You will work with him to develop uh, the project pricing and budget and at the proper time, you'll have to execute a contract. And generally for projects like this, you would be using the standard form AAA A101, which is a uh, stipulated sum contract. Again, you wanna look for a lender who has experience working with banks and will be cooperative as regards uh, working with the lender on some of the uh, disbursement provisions that the lender will insist on. Lastly, tax exempt bond transactions are almost always bonded and you will need a general contractor that qualifies to be bonded. Uh, being bondable is a function of a uh, contractor's financial strength and uh, track record. So not every contractor is able to be bonded. So that's something you will need to look at. So in addition to putting your team together, you're gonna have to deal with the other due diligence that comes with uh, building something. You have permitting and zoning issues. And to the extent your project will be seeking uh, zoning relief of any type, that is something that needs to be identified and prioritized right away. Because as we know, we live in a very heavily regulated part of the world and getting zoning relief can be a time consuming process. In addition, you, you will have permitting issues that you have to work through. And depending on the type of facility that you're trying to build, you will have uh, project specific regulatory permits that will also have to be dealt with. And again, should be uh, recognized and prioritized at the outset. Because this is a bond transaction, you will also have to uh, make a filing with the Massachusetts Historic Commission. Even if your project has nothing to do with a historical property, it's uh, usually not that uh, time consuming, but it's something that will have to be done. You will have to see if your project uh, is uh, regulated under the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act. Uh, fortunately, the standards for that project are fairly high. So most of the projects that you would be considering won't, uh, MEPA will not be applicable to, but that again is something you need to investigate and clarify. And then you will also have to deal with the host of uh, other permitting issues, uh, such as uh, dealing with the local conservation commission to the extent your project involves any wetlands. Um, with respect to MHC, I was just gonna flag that um, even if you have a property with no historical value, you will need to file what's called a PNF. And I would say that it, they have 30 days to respond to a PNF and they typically take the full 30 days. So as, as you're planning for your project, getting that in early 
um, even if you don't think you have historic property, is is very helpful. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, so, as with any construction contract, you're going to have to work through all the permitting issues. But we will assume that you do work through those permitting issues and that you are successful in building your project. And now you have post-closing considerations that come with having a bond finance project. Um, so, I mean, Eric is going to go into um, kind of private business use and other post-closing requirements, which I think are really um, probably the ones you're most interested in. Um, but one thing to flag is that the transfer of bond finance property um, or other collateral is not going to be as easy as, you know, property that's collateral for a conventional loan. Um, in particular, if the um, bond financing was used to acquire or improve the property, um, you're certainly going to need to get bond counsel involved um, and come up with a strategy for how to transfer that. Um, I, I'm working with um, a borrower now, and because they are considering their um, health and human service provider, they're um, securing their financing with multiple properties. Um, and because there are two smaller properties that they may transfer, we've actually decided to exclude them from the collateral for the bond financing, um, because that kind of planning can make it easier if, if they do ultimately decide to sell it. Um, so that is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about what property may serve as collateral for the financing. I'm going to hand it over to Eric to um, talk about the tax side. All right, good afternoon. Uh, now that Bob and Cheryl have uh, taken you through what tax exempt bond financing is and why you might consider using it, I'm gonna talk a bit about tax considerations in connection with bond financing, including the, the diligence that's required in connection with obtaining financing and post-closing compliance obligations that come with tax exempt bond financing. So as Cheryl mentioned a little while ago, uh, in connection with the tax exempt bond financing, we as borrowers counsel uh, are required to provide an opinion regard regarding the borrower's qualification as an exempt organization under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code. In order to provide that opinion, we have to review certain documents and there's often uh, a lot of discussion between us and the borrower so that we fully understand the borrower's current activities and operations. Um, one of the first documents we look for in this review is the borrower's determination letter. When an organization obtains C3 status, the IRS issues a letter called the determination letter. Uh, it used to issue, the IRS used to issue a determination letter followed by a verification letter regarding the organization's status as a private foundation or a publicly supported organization. Some organizations may also have obtained affirmation letters for various reasons such as to replace a loss determination letter. Uh, so, so the borrower might have multiple determination letters that we need to review. The determination letter should reflect the borrower's name, its EIN and its support status for tax purposes. Uh, if the borrower doesn't have that letter or if any of that information is no longer correct, you can request an affirmation letter from the IRS. And that can take a lot of time to get. So the borrower and counsel should ascertain early on whether the borrower has a copy of that letter uh, in case you're gonna have to request one from the IRS. There's some types of organizations uh, that don't have a determination letter at all. Uh, this comes up in particular with group exemptions, for example, where a central organization obtains tax exempt status and its affiliates are considered exempt due to the relationship with that central organization. This is common for a lot of Catholic organizations, as well as fraternities and sororities and some other types of organizations. So if the borrower is a type of organization that either doesn't have a determination letter, or if the de determination letter can't be located by the client or by the IRS, which happens sometimes as well, then we have to rely on other sources showing that the IRS has granted exempt status to the organization or that it has exempt status for some other reason. Bond counsel used to accept an opinion from us regarding C3 status that relied solely on the determination letter. In our experience, however, that's no longer the case. And that means that the letter is still an important part of the review, but we're no longer allowed to just, just rely on that. The next document we look at is the borrower's application for tax exemption known as the Form 1023. It's not unusual for organizations to lose this document and getting a copy from the IRS can take a long time. So 
like with the determination letter, it's important to identify this early on as to whether you can locate a copy or not in case you have to request one from the IRS. Uh, the Form 1023 contains a lot of information about an organization and the exempt activities in which it expected to engage at the time that it filed its application. A C3 opinion uh, is easy for us to provide if the borrower, borrower fully described its activities in the Form 1023, its activities have not changed, and the standards that the IRS applies to those activities haven't changed either. In those circumstances, the determination letter and the Form 1023 together provide strong evidence that the borrower continues to qualify for tax exempt status because the IRS made its determination on the basis of facts that remain substantially true. For organizations that have been in existence for a substantial period of time, however, it's not unusual for the organization's activities to have changed or expanded. It's also possible that relevant IRS standards might have changed as well. One borrower I recently worked with started out many years ago coordinating volunteer services, and now it's a direct provider of a wide range of health and human services. Uh, its current activities exceed anything contemplated in its Form 1023, and even if it had anticipated those, it formed so long ago that current standards the IRS would look at are very different. Uh, so in situations like this, we need to go a lot further and review the borrower's current activities against standards the IRS would apply today if the borrower were to apply for exempt status again. I think, Eric, that that's, this uh, is worth emphasizing because it can be something that is kind of overlooked and, and uh kind of just assume that since they've always been a nonprofit, you know, there shouldn't be any problems, but, but nonprofits do change and adapt to changing circumstances. And this is an issue that needs to be vetted, you know, early on in the process, I think. That's right. For, yeah, some organizations are unlikely to change over time, uh, but many organizations do develop and grow uh, and, and sort of the IRS standards. So that's something that, that we definitely have to look at. Um, so the IRS applies different criteria for different types of activities. Organizations that provide healthcare or similar services for a fee are subject to a test known as the community benefit test. There are specific tests that apply for organizations that provide affordable housing or housing for the elderly or handicapped or for schools. Uh, as borrowers counsel, we need to understand the borrower's various, various activities and how each of those activities aligns with the applicable IRS standards. This requires a review of the manner in which activities are conducted and frequently requires a review of income sources as well. For example, percentages of income derived from government contracts or from Medicare and Medicaid may be relevant to exempt status. Uh, sometimes we'll recommend that a borrower take certain steps to strengthen the position that it continues to qualify for tax exemption. This might happen because revenue sources changed or because there's a better uh, uh, alternative basis for exemption that is now stronger, uh, or because the IRS has developed new standards that wouldn't have originally applied to the organization. One thing that comes up for me frequently is recommending that healthcare organizations adopt a charity care policy. This is one of the factors that the IRS considers under the community benefit test, and I've encountered a number of organizations that were formed before that was something that the IRS looked at. Uh, so it's important to begin the dil diligence process early in case any steps need to be taken, like adoption of a policy that might require board action. And the next set of documents that we look at are the Forms 990. Those are the annual returns that are filed with the IRS by exempt organizations. These are publicly available documents and recent returns are frequently available online. So we often ask for just the last one or two years from the organization since those might not be available yet from our online sources. Uh, we review the Forms 990 to confirm that activities and operations are being accurately reported to the IRS and to see if there are any other factors that could be a problem. We look for issues that could impact tax exempt status like private benefit issues, how conflicts of interest are handled, how executive compensation is set, and whether an organization engages in activities that need further evaluation, like joint ventures with for-profit entities uh, or any activities that give rise to unrelated business income tax. Uh, 
Once our review is complete and we're satisfied that we can provide the 501c3 opinion, we prepare a document known as the opinion certificate to be signed by an officer or other person authorized by the organization. That certificate sets forth certain facts that are relevant to an organization's exempt status, and then we rely on that certificate in providing the 501c3 opinion. All right. Next set of requirements we're going to talk about are the, the post-issuance compliance obligations. So after a bond issuance is complete, there are some important rules that have to be followed in order to maintain the tax-exempt status of the bonds. These relate to the spending and investment of bond proceeds, arbitrage rebate, record retention, and the use of facilities financed with bond proceeds, uh, and the maintenance of your status as a 501c3 organization. Failure to comply with these rules can result in penalties, and those can include the bonds being declared taxable. And that is not good. <laughs> no, that is very bad. <laughs> uh, so the arbitrage and rebate rules are, are quite complex. In general, if bond proceeds are used to acquire investments with a higher yield than the bond yield, then the arbitrage earnings are the excess return on those investments. Arbitrage earnings are subject to certain yield restriction rules, which limit the investment yield earned on bond proceeds, uh, subject to certain exceptions. Unless an exception applies, you have to limit the yield on the investment of bond proceeds to a yield that is not materially, materially higher than the yield on the bonds. The arbitrage rebate rules require that certain arbitrage earnings be paid over to the US Treasury. So that means even if an exception applies, you might still have to pay the arbitrage earnings to the government. Uh, with respect to record retention, the Internal Revenue Code requires retention of records for federal tax purposes. Uh, in this context, the bond records include a number of documents that are generated before and at issuance of the bonds, as well as post issuance documents, such as records of investments, records of the use of bond finance property, records of expenditures of bond proceeds. And in order to in, uh, ensure the continued exclusion of interest for the bondholders, the borrower needs to retain all of these records for the life of the bond plus six years. I mean, that's going to be a significant period of time. So you may want to think about having, you know, some duplication in terms of like who knows where the records are and who's keeping them. Um, but you might also think about, you know, do we have someone, is our CFO retiring um, in the next five years? You know, who, how to make sure these records kind of go to the successor can be something to think through. Yeah, good point. Yeah. All right. Uh, with respect to reporting, the IRS Form 990 includes a schedule known as the Schedule K, and this schedule requires disclosure of certain information in connection with tax-exempt bonds. Some of this remains static from year to year, uh, like the bond issuer's EIN, the date of the issuance. Uh, other information changes every year and should be tracked. This includes the amount of the bonds retired each year, the amount of gross proceeds held in reserve funds, and, and a few other things. Uh, Schedule K also asks a series of questions about private business use, which Cheryl referred to earlier. And that brings me to the final topic here, which is monitoring the use of bond finance property for private business use. So private business use is the actual or beneficial use of tax-exempt bond finance property by any private person or for-profit entity, including any organization that is not a Section 501c3 organization acting solely in furtherance of its own exempt purpose and the borrower's exempt purpose, or a state or local government. Under the private business use rules, bonds will not qualify as tax exempt if private business use accounts for more than 5% of the net proceeds of the issue. Uh, so it's important to track all uses of tax exempt bond finance property and make sure that that 5% threshold is not crossed. Leases and occupancy agreements are obvious examples of private business uses. Uh, other agreements that can result in private business use include management and service contracts, incentive payment contracts, research contracts, contracts for naming rights, rights to locate cell towers or solar panels, uh, and contracts for private tutoring in schools. Food service contracts, like a, a contract to operate a cafeteria, uh, are one of the most common types of contracts that we see come up in this context and that we that we evaluate frequently. Uh, 
outside use of the property by a third party, such as an after school program in a school, can result in private business use, even if it's only a one time event. So the IRS has established a safe harbor for management and service contracts that meet service requirements. Uh, and that will be excluded from private business use if they meet that. So an organization should consult with counsel before entering into a, a management services agreement to ensure all requirements of the financing documents and the, and the safe harbor are satisfied, or to make sure that if it does result in private business use, it's less than that 5% threshold. Specific exception also exists for contracts of no longer than 50 days, 100 days, or 200 days, uh, in each case, subject to different requirements, and for contracts that are purely incidental to the primary function of the property, like janitorial services. Contracts for goods generally don't result in private business use, although contracts with a service component, like a printer le lease, might. So, in addition to these, the tax requirements, bondholders, lenders, and mass development typically require borrowers to obtain approval for third-party uses of tax-exempt bond financed property in order to protect their own interest in the tax-exempt status of the bonds. So a borrower could obtain specific approval from each of those organizations for a specific event. That can be pretty cumbersome, however. So when we work with organizations that, that frequently allow outside use of their properties, we work to get approval from each of those organizations of a building use policy that, that allows uses tailored to meet the private business use exceptions. Uh, if an organization is going to allow third party use regularly, that's a much more efficient method for handling those uses. So in some, some private business use is allowed, it has to be reported on the Schedule K to the Form 990 and a borrower may need to obtain approvals either for particular use or for a building use policy from other parties to the financing. And, uh, and borrowers have to track the private business use to make sure that that 5% threshold is not crossed. Otherwise, the bonds could become taxable. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Bob. Okay, well, thank you, Eric, uh, for the very thorough analysis. So uh, there you have it. Taxes and bond financing, a potential option uh, for you as borrowers to uh, pursue certain development opportunities, but there are certain regulatory requirements that come with the lower interest rate, and these regulatory requirements will exist, you know, not only at closing, but long after closing. So it is uh, a decision that uh, you have to uh, think through and is not to be taken lightly, but it could be a viable option for some of your projects. So on that note, uh, I think we can uh, open uh, the floor for questions. There was a question a little earlier, do the copies of these forms need to be paper? Can they be digital? I think that's some of the forms that Eric was, was talking about. Like the Schedule K or the uh, kind of forms around Rebate is that the was that the question? I think so. Um, I don't know exactly when this was was asked. Um, Eric, do you know if those are typically submitted digitally? Oh, incorporation forms. Um, so the um. I may I may be misunderstanding the question. I mean, typically the um, like if you're incorporating a new entity um, to be the you know kind of you know the owner of the project, um, then um, some pieces of that of the kind of creation of that entity can be submitted electronically, and the 1023 now has to be submitted electronically. Is that correct, Eric? That's correct. The 1023 is. Um, but many of those forms are readily available online. Um, the state incorporation forms are available on the Secretary of the Commonwealth's website. Um, and most of the IRS forms are, are available on the IRS website. Oh, in terms of the, the termination letter. Ah. Um, so, yeah, if you have a digital copy of that, that's great. You don't have to have the physical original of the, the first version that you ever received, yeah. 
Um, but while we're just to see if there's any other questions that come in, um, I was going to um, check, you know, Bob, maybe you and I can talk a little bit about how you could get started if you're interested in tax exempt bond financing. Well, you would probably get started by uh, talking to uh, Mass Development. Uh, there are 11 uh, agencies that have uh, tax exempt bond issuing authority in uh, Massachusetts, but uh, for, for most of the transactions that, that we're talking about, mass development would be the uh, place you would go and you would want to talk to them uh, and, and get their feedback as to, you know, the project you're doing and, and you know, whether that's something that they would be supportive of. Um, you know, one question that I sometimes get um, from borrowers is in connection with lines of credit. Um, you know, often I'll see a tax exempt bond financing paired with a new line of credit to manage kind of working capital needs. Um, and one uh, kind of tip for borrowers um, that I would highlight um, is that you want to make sure the line of credit is not secured by the same collateral um, that's securing the tax exempt bond financing. I guess I would have a question for the for the audience in terms of are, are there any uh, attendees out there who are you know at at present considering uh, or looking at a tax exempt bond uh, project? Yeah, I, I don't say, oh, there's one in the Q&A. Okay, well, hopefully we didn't scare anyone. <laughs> I was gonna say, hopefully we didn't uh, dissuade you from yeah. um, uh, tax-exempt bond financing, because I, I actually think it's a great option for um, tax-exempt entities. And, and especially now where interest rates are, um, you know, really rising, it's it's makes a lot of projects a lot more affordable. Yes, and, 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 and it is true historically that it has a reputation of being very complicated and costly. and while it is you know, more complicated and costly than a traditional bank financing, the process has become more streamlined, uh, somewhat more democratic in terms of you know, projects that previously might not have been considered because they were too small or, or whatever are, are now you know, perfectly viable uh, projects for, for uh, applying for tax exempt bond financing. Yeah, I was working with a, um, a, a kind of a, a, a tax exempt um, health and human service provider. They were acquiring a facility um, and the seller of the facility specifically in our kind of, uh, we had a financing contingency and they expressly prohibited us from going for tax exempt bond financing, which I think may have been tied to that reputation, but I actually think was very misplaced. All right. If there's no further questions, I think we should uh, let everyone kind of get back to their day. Um, but thank you all for attending. If I think the materials, um, as Claire mentioned, will be made available to you. And if you have any questions um, after the after the meeting, um, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you in a little more detail. I think there is a question that just came in. Um, as a small nonprofit that acquired a loan in the outbreak of COVID to survive, would you advise us to go for a bond loan to pay off state loan? Um, I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a, I mean, Bob, you and I may, you may have some thoughts on this as well. Um, I mean, I think it would depend on the term and the rate for the loan. Um, you know, we, um, I, I've had borrowers that, you know, actually do have some affordable rates locked in. Um, and so it doesn't, it didn't make sense to refund finance that debt. Um, you know, you'd have to see if that if that debt was eligible to be refinanced with tax exempt bond financing. Um, and I think, you know, the other piece would be the the amount that, you know, if it's a very small loan, um, it might not, it might not make sense to refinance it just because the transaction costs would be high. Right. Um, yeah. And, and and I think most bond issuers, whether they admit it or not, do have some sort of minimum that they gen generally don't like to go below just in terms of efficiencies.
So the size of the loan would be important in that regard. All right, that's all the questions. Um, thank you all for attending and thank you to the speakers for joining us today and sharing such great information. And just as a reminder, we will be emailing out a recording and the slides from today's session. So yes, thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you.